that was Utah Senator Mike Lee getting the rock star treatment at this year's state GOP convention at the Maverick Center. Mitt Romney, on the other hand. Now, you know me as a person who, uh, who says what he thinks, and I don't hide the fact that I wasn't a fan of our last president's character issues. But to be fair, there was some cheering and clapping there. You just can't hear it under the booze. This is a good example of the political moment we're in right now. And I think you know what we're talking about. It's kind of like your Facebook comment sections playing out in real life where your uncle and your BFF are arguing about cancel culture. So how the heck did Utah get here? I'm Emily Means. And I'm Sonia Hudson. That's the question we're going to try to answer in this episode of State Street, a new podcast from KUER that brings complicated issues back down to earth so that you can actually understand how they affect you. This is politics the Utah way. It's less your Facebook feed and more... You might remember us from hosting the 45 Days podcast. Sonia and I are both politics reporters here at KUER. State Street is a new and improved version of 45 Days. We'll have more seasons, more storytelling, and a better understanding of Utah politics. How did Utah get to this super tense political environment where there's a huge divide between Republicans and Democrats? Party matters way more than the candidate themselves. And then even within the Republican Party, which totally dominates state government, well, really all levels of government here, there are bitter battles going on within that party. In this episode, we're going to walk you through the last 30 years to look at those big moments that got us here. Let's turn back the clock to 1990. That was before either of us were born, Sonia. So we turned to someone who was alive then and living in Utah. You might know him. This is Radio Westenberg Fabrizio. Today in the program, we are talking about the shape of the election in Utah. Voters Doug Fabrizio is the host of Radio West on KUER. We had Doug tell us a few stories from Utah politics in the past few decades that might sound a lot like what's going on today. And in 1990, he was just out of college and starting his radio career with KUER. Also at that time, the Cold War had just ended. Janet Jackson was topping the charts. Let's go! And here in Utah, John Stockton and Carl Malone were leading the jazz. And also, on a personal note, both my and Emily's parents had just started dating. I don't think we were even a, a thought in their brains we yet. Weren't, I wasn't even a blip on Bob and Mary Beth's brains yet. <laughs> we're talking about 1990 because of a guy named Bill Orton. Orton was running for Congress that year. He was running as a Democrat in Utah's third congressional district, And districts were a lot simpler back then. That district was basically Utah County down to the southern border of the state. And Doug told me that at that time, it was thought of as the most conservative district in the country. Before 1990, there was an inclination among Utah voters, even though they were conservative and had been for a while, that they would vote for a Democrat. They would consider that anyway. And you never really knew what would be the thing that would change their mind. It could have been a policy stance, or it could have just been the candidate's personality. So in 1990, there's a congressional race in the third congressional district. We're talking Utah County, mostly, right? Very Republican, and the people there, very conservative. And there was a race going on between the Democrat, Bill Orton. No one had really thought of who he was. He was a tax attorney running against a Republican stalwart named Carl Snow, who had been around in Utah politics and was well-regarded. And I think most people figured, of course, he's a shoe in Well, he was a shoe in but then the Republican Party made a decision really at the 11th hour of the campaign that dramatically changed the way that the race panned out. Two days before the election a political ad run by the state Republican Party on behalf of Carl Snow ran in a newspaper in Utah County. It was a picture of Carl Snow, Mormon patriarch, you know, big family, big Mormon family. The caption said, Carl Snow and his family. 
And on the other side was a picture of Bill Orton, tax attorney, not married yet. He's standing alone in this picture. And that caption read, Bill Orton and his family. And then there's a bigger caption, and it says, Some candidates want you to believe their personal values don't matter. And here's the tagline. Values do matter. Vote Republican. Dang, that's not very nice. It's kind of harsh. Yeah, rude. So basically the implication is that Orton doesn't care about families, so he can't be a good elected official if he's single. And that seems to make a big difference in the outcome of this election. Carl Snow, Republican candidate, got beat by Bill Orton. And it was shocking. I was watching, I think it was KSL television, and one of the political reporters John Hollenhorst, was live talking about what's going on in the election right now. And the returns had come that Bill Orton was beating Carl Snow. And John Hollenhorst, the reporter, didn't believe it. He's like, this can't be right. But sure enough, Bill Orton won. Six years later, Orton is still in office. He has been able to survive in this uber conservative district as a moderate Democrat. But then something happened actually at the federal level that shakes all that up and makes things a lot more complicated for Bill Orton. Bill Clinton is president. Clinton actually comes out west and designates the Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument. And that's actually in Orton's district. And he makes this announcement in Arizona with the beautiful backdrop of the Grand Canyon, which had really, if you think about it, nothing to do with the Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument, because that was in Utah. We're saying very simply, our parents and grandparents saved the Grand Canyon for us. Today, we will save the Grand Escalante Canyons and the Kaparowitz Plateaus of Utah for our children. And that really enraged all kinds of political figures, you know, moderate political figures, Republicans, even Democrats were upset at the optics of that. You know, we've had so-called sagebrush rebellions in this state throughout our history. That is, these battles with the federal government over land. I think this was a new version of it. And I think that was a really important turning point, at least turning moderates toward the Republican Party. And this all might sound a whole lot like what is currently happening with the Bears Ears National Monument, which was created and then it was downsized and is spurring these same sort of debates right now. Okay, let's go back to Bill Orton. 1996 was a big year for him, too, because he was up for re-election again. This was actually also a big year for me because this was the year I was born. I think I was was about 10 days old on Election Day, something around there. But anyway, Orton's Republican opponent actually uses the Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument designation against Orton. The idea is that Orton should have had a big impact on this decision. It was in his district and the president was a member of his own party. I listened back to some KUER stories from this time It's really clear that Utahns wanted a Republican in office as sort of a check on Bill Clinton's power. In this case, party really mattered. This Republican voter, Joan John, which is a great name, by the way, really sums that up. Here is what she told KBR about her thoughts on Orton back in 1996. He's a very decent person, an honest and a man with integrity that we should have in Congress. I wish he'd come back as a Republican. In this wave of kind of anguish and turmoil and partisanship, this moderate figure who had been able to survive in the most conservative congressional district in the country, Bill Orton, loses. And he doesn't ever get back. He sort of fades off into the distance. And this was a turning point because it marked a shift from when Republicans in Utah were willing to vote for Democrats. At that time, people cared more about the candidate than their party affiliation. But the 1996 election is when that D or R next to your name on the ballot becomes super important and can really make or break you. Bill Orton losing meant there weren't any Democrats representing Utah in Congress until 2000. 
A lot happened that year. We survived Y2K. There was a presidential election between George Bush and Al Gore, which went all the way to the Supreme Court. Very dramatic. Also at this time, Utah is preparing to host the 2002 Olympics. Let me tell you, Sonia, this was a monumental year for me because it was the year. I saw Britney Spears in her Oops, I Did It Again tour at the Delta Center. I'm jealous. Well, I'll describe it to you in great detail offline, okay? All right. Not only was this a big year for Britney Spears, this was also a big year for Democrat Jim Matheson here in Utah because he was elected to Congress this year. He wins with 56% of the vote, and that's partially because of how Utah's congressional districts were set up at the time. There was basically a northern Utah district, a southern Utah district, and then Matheson's district, which was basically just Salt Lake County. Utah's voting districts are redrawn every 10 years based on new population data from the census. And we're actually in the process of doing that right now in 2021. It's this process called redistricting. Utah's state legislature, which, Sonia, you'll remember, is controlled by Republicans. I had no idea. In case you were wondering, uh, they're responsible for redrawing those voting boundaries. When the legislature redraws the lines in 2001... Part of Salt Lake County gets cut out of Matheson's district, and his new district stretches from Salt Lake City all the way down to St. George, which is a much more rural and Republican part of the state. All in all, it's more conservative. And now the map looks a little bit more like a pizza with three slices in it. It's not a donut anymore. Nope. We switched food groups. So Republicans managed to redraw the district to make it more difficult for the Democrat, Jim Matheson. And, you know, he manages to stay in office. But each and every race is a struggle. He has to, again, like Orton did, move to the center, if not to the right, on certain issues. Then redistricting happens again in 2011, right? Happens every decade. And Utah gets another congressional seat because the population in the state exploded And Jim Matheson runs in this new district until he bows out in 2014. That new congressional district that they created is the fourth congressional district, and it becomes the state's only swing district. We've got Republican Mia Love winning the seat in 2014. Then she loses to Democrat Ben McAdams in 2018. And then McAdams loses to far-right Republican Burgess Owens in this most recent election. Basically, this district goes back and forth and back and forth. Let's go back to redistricting in 2001. I asked Doug ultimately what impact that redistricting had on Utah politics as a whole. Well, what it does is it cements the Republican Party as if it didn't need to be more cemented as just a stronger force in the state. You used to have an occasional member of the delegation. Jim Matheson was one. Bill Orton was one. who was an actual Democrat. But through that redistricting process, Republicans saw to it that that would be something quite rare. So instead of having one fairly reliable Democratic district, you have this swing district that if a Democrat wins, they're going to win it really narrowly. Really narrowly. And that's sort of where we are now. And where we are now, Sonia, is a break. You're listening to State Street from KUER. We'll be back in just a minute. Support for KUER comes from the local businesses and organizations that sponsor our programming. We're proud to partner with the community in support of local news and information that thousands of Utahns depend on every day. KUER sponsors reach public radio listeners on the air and online with information about the goods and services they provide. To learn more about sponsorship opportunities with KUER, visit sponsorkuer.org. You're listening to State Street. I'm Sonia Hudson. I'm Emily Means. Now we're going to talk about... The current rock star of the Utah Republican Party convention, Mike Lee. Hello again, Utah! Doug helped us understand this tension between the Democrats and Republicans. 
And like we said, it's redistricting time again. That's definitely something to keep in mind as the legislature draws these maps again this year. Let's now look at the friction within the GOP in Utah, because the Republican Party here has so much power that they really only need to fight with themselves. And that's really evident in the 2010 state GOP convention, which, Emily, you know this because we spent a very eventful Saturday at one earlier this year. It was a time. These conventions really bring out the people who are super into politics. There's so much energy and passion and also just kind of fanfare there. I think Doug put it best. Political party conventions are great American theater. You go in and there are booths and there are placards and there's tons of flags, red, white, and blue everywhere, of course. All of this kind of enthusiasm, it's like everyone is running for office. That's what plays out at the Salt Palace in 2010. One of Utah senators, Bob Bennett, who some people viewed as a more moderate Republican, Bennett is in trouble. The Tea Party movement is really gaining speed in the country. And this is such a dramatic movement, my gateway drug to political reporting. I think I was like 13, 14. Anyway, the Tea Party is very anti-establishment. They are mad about President Barack Obama, government spending, especially the bank bailout during the 08 recession. When Bob Bennett enters the convention at the Salt Palace in May of 2010, there's 3,500 delegates present, and a lot of them are not at all happy with their senator. They're chanting TARP, 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 which of course stands for the bailout that Bob Bennett had voted for. He enraged conservatives for voting for that $700 billion bailout, and they're waving these yellow flags that say, don't tread on me. This is clearly the sort of Tea Party movement. So they're not happy. One of the seven people challenging Bob Bennett, that seven people, is Mike Lee. Mike Lee, who was general counsel for Governor Huntsman. He was also a clerk for Samuel Alito. So he has his kind of conservative bona fides. No one really knows who he is at the time, though. He's kind of a political nobody. Bennett very much represents the establishment that the Tea Party hates. So at this 2010 convention, after that first round of voting, the only candidates left are Bennett, Lee, and another candidate, a businessman and party insider named Tim Bridgewater. Second round comes and the vote. Tim Bridgewater, 37% of the vote. Mike Lee, 36%. The incumbent... Senator, Bob Bennett, three-term senator, 27% of the vote. Barely more than a quarter. He's out. He loses. And people were exultant. This was the first actual success that this anti-establishment wing of the party had had. Bob Bennett's loss is bananas. It's so surprising that it even makes national news. We had a development yesterday uh, that really makes you stand up and take notice. Senator Bennett, Bob Bennett of Utah. He was removed from the ballot at a Republican convention dominated by activists in the Tea Party movement. The Republican senator was essentially uh, defeated by uh, the organizing prowess of the Tea Party movement in Utah. Bob Bennett is one of the first incumbents across the country to get ousted by this far-right anti-establishment faction, the Tea Party faction. And Doug told me that this event represented a power shift within the GOP. I think there was a sense of panic within the mainstream Republican Party at the time. So people were freaked out by this idea that an extreme wing of the party had ousted a very popular incumbent. So for the first time now, you've got what was perceived as a fringe element the more extreme side of the party, making a decision for the rest of Utahns who probably, if they were to be making that decision themselves, would have opted for Bob Bennett. Basically, instead of these right-wing Republicans being a fringe group, a minority within the party, in 2010, they become a faction of the party that has real power because they're the ones showing up at convention. And that's continued to today. 
And so the reaction to that is the establishment Republicans in the following years create another path to the ballot. If you gather enough signatures, you can make it to the primary election without going to the convention where those more extreme delegates are choosing the candidate. Yeah. And Emily, since then, that has been a source of constant tension within the state party. There has been lawsuits. The Republican Party has tried to overturn it pretty much every year up on Capitol Hill. There's a new bill trying to either undo it or poke holes in it. It's definitely a polarizing issue within the GOP. It squarely puts the two sides of the GOP in their opposing camps. And that feud between them is still going on today. So fast forward five years, it's 2015, and Donald Trump enters the stage, and he does so very dramatically. We're watching Donald Trump make a very long, drawn-out uh, entrance into the room. We just saw him coming down. He an descends escalator. on an escalator and, and announces and he's running for president. For me, this was interesting because I'm just starting my career in journalism. I'm working at the Salt Lake Tribune, learning a lot more about politics. So this was something that sparked a lot of the interests I have now. Trump becomes the face of that wing of the GOP, the Tea Party far right Mike Lee wing. But at that time when he comes onto the stage, he is a really divisive figure among Republicans in Utah. And it's mostly for the way that he talks. They're bringing crime, they're rapists, and some, I assume, are good people. Written by a nice reporter. Now the poor guy, you got to see this guy. Oh, I don't know what I said. Oh, I don't remember. You can do anything. Whatever you want. Grab him by the There was a dilemma for Republicans in this state. Do they go for the Democrat, who was the least popular Democratic candidate probably in history in this state, Hillary Clinton, or do they vote for Donald Trump? And what a lot did, 20-some percent did, was they voted for someone else. Evan McMullen emerges. Evan McMullen is an independent. He's also a Latter-day Saint Republican, so you can understand why he was popular among people in Utah who were skeptical of Trump. On election day, the vote ends up getting split with McMullen, this third-party candidate. Donald Trump still, of course, does carry the state, 45% which was the first time, I think, in a good number of years that the Republican candidate didn't get the majority. Trump isn't just divisive among Utah voters, though. He's also divisive among Utah's two senators, Mitt Romney and Mike Lee. They both come to represent the two sides of the Republican Party that think about Trump in very different ways. Mike Lee is seen as an ally of Donald Trump or comes to be seen as an ally. Mitt Romney, of course, has a very conflicted relationship with Donald Trump, doesn't like him, says so publicly in a very prominent speech. Donald Trump is a phony, a fraud. His promises are as worth... And Mitt Romney's dislike for Trump really comes to a head when Donald Trump is impeached the first time in 2020. During that impeachment trial, all eyes were on Romney. And finally, the day comes when the senators are going to vote and Romney makes this bombshell announcement that he's going to vote to convict the president. Huge deal. This was a huge deal. And it was historic because it was the first time someone had voted against a president of their own party. So we're all bracing for how he was going to justify it when Mitt Romney steps up to the lectern in the chamber of the Senate, everyone in the country who was interested in this was paying absolute attention. So I think what was interesting about his speech, I was really struck by this. Romney had been, really throughout his political career anyway, reluctant to lean into his faith. But in that speech, Romney really leaned into and in fact justified his decision based on the fact that he's a religious man. But my promise before God to apply impartial justice required that I put my personal feelings and political biases aside. On the other hand, Mike Lee joins all the other Republicans and votes against convicting Trump. He and Romney are 
both members of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. But Lee says he based his decision on his own interpretation of the Constitution. We cannot remove the 45th president of the United States for doing something that the law and the Constitution allows him to do without doing undue violence to that system of government to which every single one of us has sworn an oath. After Romney makes this historic vote and has this very emotional speech about his connection to God, he actually comes home to Utah to basically explain himself to state leaders. He literally boards a red-eye flight from D.C. to meet with them in the middle of the legislative session. And I remember the morning that this happened, I was down in the basement in the bowels of the state capitol in the press room, probably slamming on getting some story together. But some other reporters spotted Romney briefly upstairs and we were all like, oh, my God, why is he here? We learned from talking to lawmakers that he did meet with state leaders. Some of them said, you know, they respected his decision, even though they disagreed with it. Others did not respect his decision and actually unsuccessfully tried to get the legislature to censure him. And this is important because Romney solidifies himself as basically an enemy of pro-Trump Republicans. I can't tell you how many voters I've talked to that are still so outraged about this. And it makes the fact that Romney voted with Trump most of the time on bills and policy issues basically meaningless. Like that is overshadowed by Mitt Romney's impeachment vote. And it becomes about choosing sides, right? Mm -hmm. And this year, in 2021, Romney votes to convict Trump again in the second impeachment trial. So basically, he digs himself an even bigger hole with that faction of the party that is so pro-Trump. And this time, the party really goes after him. He nearly gets censured at the state GOP convention this year that we went to, Sonia. And that measure failed by a very slim margin as well, just 87 votes. But Romney didn't escape the convention unscathed. Still got booed. Still got booed. Now, those boos may seem unprecedented, but there's actually been this tension for years. And in fact, the boos are also precedented, Sonia. Former Governor Mike Levitt was booed at the 2000 GOP convention. And get this, Levitt literally blew kisses at the crowd as he's being booed. That's a move. It really is. It really is. So all in all, the last 30 years, Doug says things haven't really changed. Every year we do, with Radio West, a show that analyzes the election. And every year I seem to write the same thing, which is nothing really changed. I mean, you still have super majorities in the House and the Senate. That's not changing. You still have members of the congressional delegation that are now solidly Republican. That will change a bit, maybe here and there. Republicans are going to redraw the boundaries now. So, yeah, I've been surprised occasionally, but the thing that I've noticed is things haven't changed that much in Utah over the years. The current moment we're in might seem like it's the craziest it's ever been. But the divide between Mitt Romney and Mike Lee and the, those parts of the Republican Party they represent is actually something that's been stewing for decades so, Sonia, we asked, how the heck did we get here? I guess you could say we've always been here. Thanks to Doug Fabrizio for joining us today and walking us through these last 30 years. To hear more of Doug's work, you can go to RadioWest.org. And there's a lot more ahead this season. We're going to be exploring what makes Utah politics, Utah politics, and how that impacts you. Next time, we're going to be digging into the ever popular phrase, that's the Utah way. That's that idea that Utah politics is nice, it's civil, and people work together collaboratively. That does it for this episode of State Street. I'm Emily Means. And I'm Sonia Hudson. The show was edited by Caroline Ballard and produced by Roddy Nickpour. Chelsea Naughton is the podcast executive producer, and Palak Jaiswal is our digital producer. Our news director is Elaine Clark. 
State Street is a production of KUER. We also send out a newsletter every week with fun bonus content and plenty of musing about Utah politics. You can sign up for that newsletter at KUER.org slash State Street. I was in second grade. I went with my best friend, Haley Barnett, and our moms took us to this Britney Spears concert where we were obviously too young to actually, like, we're too young for Britney Spears. From KUER.